My name's Adam Rod, and I'm this year's Editor-in-Chief of the Duke Journal of Gender Law and Policy. I'm also lucky enough to be joined today by Ms. Tara Brennan, who is one of our co-chairs of the Coalition Against Gendered Violence. And the first thing I really just want to do is I want to welcome you all to our symposium. I want to thank you all so much for coming. Um, I really actually want to thank those of you that are first-year students and don't know how great the journal is and what awesome work we do, but didn't know that there was free food and thought you'd drop in to check it out. So if you all could just indulge me for a moment um, so I can brag about the journal and how awesome it's been to me. Um, the Duke Journal of Gender Law and Policy publishes on the issues of race, gender, class, and sexuality, which at least I personally and humbly believe are the most important issues that any law journal could aspire to publish on. Um, I know you guys are going to have a lot of options at the end of this year as far as whether or not to write onto a journal, and if so, which ones to consider most favorably. But being a part of the journal, honestly, has probably been the best thing to have in my academic career. So I'd really consider, or I'd really urge you guys to give us a look. Um, so now to move on to the business of the day. Um, we're trying a three-day symposium for the first time ever this year. Um, today, we're going to have a presentation on domestic violence and sexual violence, which is my personal pet issue. Tomorrow, we're going to have speakers to discuss women in the corporate environment and law firms, that sort of thing. And then finally, on Thursday, we're going to close with a discussion of LGBT issues and the law. Um, just a few more things before I sit down and shut up. Um, the person that's responsible for organizing all of this is actually sitting down in the second row, Ms. Gina Oderda. It's been <laughs> such a pleasure to work with Eugenia these past two years, and it's really been an honor to be your team, and I really appreciate all your hard work. And as far as the free food that we're all enjoying today, I actually can't take credit for that either. That's provided by the Duke Bar Association and the Coalition Against Gendered Violence. One of their co-chairs is Tara Brennan. Tara Brennan, I apologize. And I'd like to turn things over to Tara right now to say a few words about our second presenter, Ms. Lantamon. Hi, guys. Um, unfortunately, Lanta is not here yet. She's had an emergency at her apartment, and um, they think there's been a break-in. So she's going to do her best to get here by the end of the symposium. But in the meantime, I wanted to sort of give you her background and present my introduction on her anyway um, in hopes that she makes it here on time. And if she doesn't, definitely, definitely read her article when it comes out, because it'll be coming out in the spring 2010 issue. So I'm honored today to introduce Lanta Wang, who will be presenting her forthcoming article entitled, Violence Against Women and Girls as a Cause and Consequence of HIV AIDS. Having known Lanta over the past two years and serving as co-chair of the Coalition Against Gender Violence with her, I often describe her as a rock star because of her tireless work in gender, public health, and children's issues. As an undergraduate at Miami University focusing on international public health, Lanta was president of the Association of Women Students, a rape victim advocate and program assistant for the Butler County Rape Crisis Program, and a summer volunteer at National Cheng Kung University Hospital Emergency Department in Taiwan. Among the many prestigious awards Lanta received as an undergraduate for her service and scholarship, she was also awarded the Joanna Jackson Goldman Memorial Scholarship, one of the largest research, postgraduate research scholarships offered in the United States. Through this scholarship, Lanta researched various public health issues through which she authored Sexual Violence and Psychosocial Issues at the Workplace, published by the International Labor Organization, and she co-authored Rape, How Women, the Community, and the Health Sector Respond, published by World Health Organization and Sexual Violence Research Initiative. This research also culminated in her design of culturally sensitive interviewing techniques, questionnaires, um, training manuals and data collection protocols for intimate partner violence to be used by community partners and field workers in Bangladesh and Uganda for the International Center for Research on Women in Washington, D.C. Since attending Duke Law School, Lanta has continued her outstanding efforts and is a certified student for the, children, the Duke Children's Law Clinic a guardian ad litem for the Duke Guardian for the North Carolina Guardian ad litem program, a legal intern for the National Health Law Program, and of course, my personal favorite, co-chair of the Coalition Against Gendered Violence. This summer, Lanta also worked for the World Health Organization, where she performed a systematic review of mandatory international reporting laws for intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Thus, 
When I describe Lanta as a rock star, I'm not just merely being kind. Her experience and efforts are beyond that of her age, and I hope you enjoy her presentation today as much as I know I will. To present our first speaker, I'm going to hand it back over to Adam, and thank you for your time. But before we hopefully hear from Lanta, we're going to be hearing from Mr. Joseph Fischel. Joseph Fischel is a PhD candidate in political science in my hometown at the University of Chicago. That's where he also received his MA. And he's currently a Hormel Fellow at the Center for Gender Studies. His dissertation will be entitled Sex and Harm in the Age of Consent. And today he is presenting from that dissertation a chapter entitled Transcendent Homosexuals and Dangerous Sex Offenders, Sexual Harm and Freedom in the Judicial Imaginary. Um, I'd like you all to please welcome me right now in, jo in welcoming Joseph Fischel. Thanks. I don't have any fancy PowerPoint or anything, so you're just going to have to look at me. Uh, okay. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to Adam and to the staff of the Journal of Gender Law and Policy for having me here. Um, I feel a little bit like I have this imposter complex because for me this has been an academic intellectual question and I don't have the same kind of uh, credentials as our absent speaker does. So you're gonna have to decide if what I'm saying is worthwhile or bullshit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and happy Groundhog Day. Okay. So uh, as Adam mentioned, the article is entitled Transcendent Homosexuals and Dangerous Sex Offenders, Sexual Harm and Freedom in the Judicial Imaginary. I also speak way too fast, so if I'm just, you just yell at me to slow down. Um, uh, and the article explicates and critiques the Supreme Court rulings on sex offender registration notification requirements. Um, and I, I critique it imminently, which is to say by I parse the rhetoric and argument of the sex offender cases against the rhetoric and argument of Lawrence v. Texas, um, um, the parallels of which, or the asymmetries of which, are particularly striking because they were all handed down in the same spring, summer session of 2003. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a step back. That's what the article does. I'm gonna take a step back and explain how I got here. Um, so I am I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago with interests in contemporary political theory, public law, feminist and queer studies. Um, there are two major normative propellants that drive my work within these larger fields. Uh, the first is the kind of cheese ball one that I started out going to graduate school with, which is to save the world and make it a better place and you know, eradicate things like inequality and injustice um, through the pursuit of truth and knowledge, despite Foucault's warning to the contrary. Um, and the, the, uh, the second question, which is sort of more inherited from feminist and queer thought, I guess, yeah. Um, um, how is the rhetoric of harm employed to advance social and political objectives, right? So how is harm language used uh, and the fear of danger used to leverage agendas? Um, this, of course, is a question that spans everything from the war on drugs to the war on terror to sex offender registration notification requirements. Um, so tacking then between these questions, my dissertation examines social and legal constructions of contemporary social and legal constructions of the child, the sex offender, and the idea of consent um, in, the, in the United States um, to explore how and why sexual harm is understood the way it is in the present moment. Um, the two middle chapters, the centralized law, so this one on sex offenders, another one on age of, age of consent statues, what they are and what I think they should be. Um, and then the bracketing chapters are on uh, cultural representation. So I look at texts and films like To Catch a Predator and SVU uh, and <laughs> Lolita and Superbad, and I can explain later if you want why I choose these texts, um, to look at how age, gender, sexuality, and the image of law um, function together to, to, di to dimensionalize or frame the problem of sexual harm as, as we think of it or as we know it. Um, so the last throat clearing info tidbit I will give you um, another consideration that inspired my project, um, the cultural nar narratives that get played out that involve gay people, sex with children, and sex offenders um, is phenomenally complicated and interesting, fascinating, and sort of generally unfortunate for all parties involved, namely gay people, children, and sex offenders. Um, so, you know, just a few examples. Any, any time that gay people make, you know, aspire for, for political 
rights or just to not be arrested, you can guarantee the opposition is going to talk about children, right? So um, the, the post-war sort of scare about sex offenders in the late 40s was leveraged to crack down on gay bars and gay veterans coming back from the war or the 70s, child porn panic, the same thing. Um, and of course, Prop 8, right? All, every, the entire opposition to Prop 8 is, is centralizes children in public schools, right? Which is, a, I mean, the issue is about the statutory distribution of benefits to adult couples, and yet it's all about children in public schools. Um, one of the questions the defense lawyer asked to the, uh, in, in the federal Prop 8 court, uh, federal case to uh, one of the plaintiffs was, you know, do you think teachers should, should be teaching first and second grade children about sex? And it's like, what does this guy care about? Okay, so, so and, and there's always, the, the stuff's always going on, right? And, and from the other side, right, national gay organizations constantly have to disassociate and say, we're not that, we're not sex offenders, we're not having that NAMBLA march in our parade. Um, you know, there's that recent SVU about this, the pedophile who just believes he's naturally a pedophile and Dr. the, what's his name? I don't know his name. But he's, you know, he says, you know, it, it offends me as a psychiatrist and as a homosexual, and it's all sort of self-righteous and right. So, so this is all going on. I think there's a complicated, interesting history about gay folks and children and and pedophilia, um, and the political figurations of such. Um, so these are the, some of the theoretical political coordinates that motivate the dissertation. I'm now going to talk about the article. Um, am I right, time-wise? I just keep rocking. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to jump directly into it, explaining the bare bones uh, facts of the sex offender registration notification cases, uh, and then compare the reasoning of the rhetoric and reasoning of those cases to the to Lawrence and to Lawrence's overturning of Bowers. Um, and I'm just assuming that you guys have basic knowledge of the things that I'm talking about. Okay, um, uh, and then I'll give some you know exposition or enlightenment or something. Okay, uh, so um, in 2003. Before Lawrence v. Texas, the court hears Smith v. Doe and Connecticut Department of Public Safety v. Doe. Yes. Uh, and in the first case, Smith v. Doe, the Doe's claim that, um, that the sex offender registration notification requirements in Alaska violate ex post facto because they were sex offenders before these registration notification laws, and they're saying that the laws are a, are, are a form of punishment and therefore right, are being applied retroactively. Um, and I'm not going to go through all that. You guys generally know the registration, right? Sex offenders have to go online, and it's different, bracketed, different. Usually there's two different levels, and you, know, you have to be online for 15 years or 25 years, and, and all sorts of information about you is posted online, like your name and your address and your employment and your car and your driver's license and that kind of thing. So uh, delivering, delivering the majority opinion, Justice Kennedy rules that uh, the laws are regulatory. They're not punitive. Um, they don't meet any of the criteria stipulated under Mendoza-Martinez that would override legislative intent as regulatory, um, and the intent, obviously, is to keep the public safe from dangerous sex offenders. Okay, that's Smith v. Doe. Uh, in Connecticut, um, the two John Doe's and the wife of a John Doe uh, claim that the laws violate procedural due process because uh, there's no, there's no pre-deprivation hearing to assess their dangerousness, right? So it's all conviction-based. So once you're a sex offender, you go on this, on this sex offender online registry, and there's no way to appeal that. Um, and, and the argument is that there should be some kind of, since, there, since the liberty at stake is a liberty and reputation stigma plus which we can, I can talk about later if you want, they need to have some kind of um, administrative process to go through, right, to appeal the online registry. Um, here, in, in, a unanim, in a unanimous opinion, Justice Rehnquist writes that the offender's dangerousness doesn't matter. There's no reason to have an appeal on dangerousness because that's not what the Connecticut law was tracking. It was tracking being a sex offender. So it was saying they don't care about your dangerousness. They care about if you're a sex offender. There's no hearing necessary to determine if you're a sex offender because you are a sex offender. Uh, so, and sex offenders are not, you know, a suspect class. Uh, so, yes, okay. Um, oh, and he said, Rehnquist says, you know, there is no liberty, there is no fundamental liberty at stake here anyway, but if there were, there'd be no hearing necessary. Um, okay, and you guys can call me out on all the kind of things I say wrong about the law and the intricacies of it because I'm gonna get things wrong. Um, Okay, so then what might we learn reading Smith and Connecticut against Lawrence and Lawrence's overturning of Bowers, right? Bowers held sodomy law as constitutional. Lawrence overturns that. Um, so I compare them and I go into sort of three modes of analogizing 
Um, the first I call sodomizing and recidivating. Um, in, in Bowers, right, Justice White talks about how the U.S. has this long and transhistorical um, um, transhistorical history of sodomy statutes um, and that they've always been in place and that morality and tradition are perfectly adequate rationales for having these laws. Uh, Chief Justice Berger, you know, chimes in that there's been millennia of morality against homosexuality and these laws are, are fine. Um, as many of you probably know, Justice Kennedy in Lawrence has no patience for any of this. He's quite a good, <clears throat> quite a good, you know, revisionist historian and says sodomy laws are not transhistorical. Uh, they only added same-sex sodomy in the 70s. Most states have dropped their sodomy laws, and there is no morality of millennia, millennia of morality against homosexuality, but it's more complicated than that. Um, and besides, he says, borrowing from Foucault and Jonathan Ed Katz and Estelle Friedman, these laws cannot have been targeted always and forever against homosexuals, as the homosexual is an historically recent contingent figure of modernity. He didn't say that. Those are my words. But uh, So, which, you know, anyone knows from... Volume one of, yeah, okay. So uh, despite the skepticism around grand sweeping historical claims, Justice Kennedy again in Smith and Rehnquist in Connecticut uncritically and unequivocally accept the maxim that sex offenders have high recidivism rates, uh, that sex offenders are a serious threat to the nation. Despite the kind of pathos and power of this social fact, uh, it is just social. Uh, study after study suggests that it's not true. And this is really always hard to tell people because it, it just sounds so true and we all sort of know that recidivism is really high among this group. Um, but uh, it's not true. And, and sex offenders have the lowest recidivist rates of violent criminals. Second, the sentence itself is sort of barely grammatically sensible because the category sex offender is a legally constructed category of persons. So, and, and it's broad, right? So it covers everyone from the 17-year-old who has sex with his 15-year-old girlfriend to the child molester to the guy who like pees in public. So the idea of saying that they all have high recidiv recidivating rates is weird. I mean, what does it mean to say a 17-year-old is a recidivist if he keeps having sex with his girlfriend or whatever? Um, OK. So uh, third, the studies that the justices cite, these, bu these um, Bureau of Justice and Statistics studies in 83 and 97, just don't say that. And they say that they do say that. Um, but if you read them, what they actually say is that sexually violent crimes have a lower recidiv recidiv recidivism rate. Um, the only fact that might be used to leverage that kind of argument in the case is that rapists are more likely to rape than non-rapists, which is to say that if you are convicted of rape, you're likely to rape again than if you've been convicted of armed robbery. Like, he's less likely to rape you than the rapist. Okay, so that is not that surprising. Um, when the homosexual is historical, emerges at the end of the 19th century, the sex offender of Smith and Connecticut appears transhistoric, prediscursive, and perverted. Like hardcore pornogra pornography, the court knows a sex offender when it sees one. That the sex offender is an explicitly legal construct seems only to suggest to the court that the law applies a concept to a person, but that that concept is simply right. These people are like this, threatening, recidivistic, pathologically violent. Um, we just hadn't come up with a name for it yet. And eclipsed, of course, are the wide range of people classified as such. Um, and the, the construction assumes sex offenders constitutive immunity of therapy and rehabilitation. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to like go through this whole gimmicky thing of like Bowers and Lawrence, Smith and Connecticut, and just go through the other two strategies I identify in Smith and Connecticut that enable the court to reject the sex offender's constitutional claims. So the, the second is the sort of shuttling between acts and identities. This was a, um, a concept that Janet Haley identified in Bowers and in Lawrence, or in Bowers, and actually she's, well, not this article, but she's published a lot on queer theory and the law in your Journal. Um, so the argument here is that when in Smith v. Doe, sex offenders say, look, you are punishing us based on the status that we're, you know, this is a form of punishment, you're targeting sex offenders. The court says, no, we're not targeting you because we're sex offenders, we're targeting you because you're dangerous. And in the Connecticut case, when they say, you're not assessing our dangerousness, the court says, we don't care about your dangerousness, we're targeting the class sex offenders, right? So in the one case where they push their identities and say you're targeting this. So they, the court switches up, right? The, the sex offenders say, look, um, this is about, yes, they just sort of legally determine that sex offenders are dangerous, right, without assessment. And then tack, tack back and forth between an act argument and identity argument to neutralize the claims. 
I realized that I was that was not that sensible. But okay. Uh, the third uh, Kate, the third um, mode of reasoning I call straw liberties. Um, this is probably familiar to you all. So uh, in 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 Bowers v. Hardwick, Justice White says, you know, the question before us is, you know, does the Constitution provide a fundamental right to engage in homosexual sodomy? And it's like, <laughs> surprise, there's no gay sex in the Constitution. So, <laughs> so there's this thing about, you know, constructing the liberty as such to sort of write it off. Um, in these cases, substantive liberty is not entertained. It's just, it's just procedural. Um, but all the, but a, lot, a whole bunch of circuit courts have, have entertained a substantive liberty claim where sex offenders say, you know, it's invading my right to privacy or my right to get employment or my right to fair housing or to live with my family. Um, and invariably, each case, the, the judges sort of re-articulate the question as, does a sex offender have the right to have his name removed off of a sex offender list? And like, surprise, <laughs> there's no right in the Constitution to have your sex offender, have your name removed off the sex offender list. Um, framed as such, it is not John Doe, the court considers, um, sex, but, but a sex offender, sex offending and re-offending, uh, the presumption of recidivism tautologically built into the question. Like, it's, it, it becomes a question so obvious it doesn't need answering, right? Can it, like, like does a sex, should a sex offender not be on a sex offending list? Like, of course he should be. He sex offends. Um, so John Doe's are reduced in this way to a personage, right? A personage automatically betraying a past and inevitable future of dangerous acts. So um, I need that. Hold on a second. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, many lefty, good lefty law journals and notes um, and other cultural critics have pointed out what is now obvious and like the subject of, you know, South Park shows and a whole bunch of other satires, um, okay, uh, that <laughs> these laws are kind of a mess, right? The, the notification and registration laws. Um, they're grossly overbroad, so everyone and their mother is a sex offender. Um, they, you know, usually juveniles have to go online. Um, um, all sorts, of, you know, all degrees of crimes, uh, you know, your address, employment, all of that goes there. Um, there's lots of empirical research that suggests these laws uh, just don't work. So communities with more stringent notification laws aren't any safer um, in terms of sexual violence than communities that 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 do have more stringent laws. Um, there seems to be no deterrence effect, um, given that sex, sexual violence happens mostly in families, and these laws are mostly about targeting the stranger in the park. There's another sort of reason why this doesn't; these seem to not work. Um, residency restrictions seem particularly perverse in that uh, they they bracket out, you know, sex offenders can only live within 1,000 feet, outside 1,000 or 2,000 feet of a school, but that means that sex offenders like all live together in one house, which is like breeding ground for, you know, recidivist behavior, um, which would be funny, right, if it weren't like really upsetting. Um, I guess it's a little funny. Um, so, so... Okay, and then of course, right, sex offenders get their houses burned down and get beat up and get killed and commit suicide and like that. Um, so this is all true, uh, but does not quite get at why these laws have such staying power, why they generally receive judicial approval, what kind of cultural palliative work they are doing, nor does it get at an underlying logic that attributes harm and danger onto pathological types. Um, um, critics say the laws provide a false sense of security or are motivated by public fear. Indeed, um, but I also want to hypothesize that what mechanizes these laws and their judicial defense is an absence of measured theorizing on harm, sex, and power, an absence, and this part's a little like polemic and gimmicky, an absence that has become a crisis as the homosexual is no longer fair game for subordination and projection, an absence that is then filled in by moralized and fictive certainties and reliably predictable tropes. These certainties and tropes provide not only, not or not only a false sense of security, but I think a false sense of knowing by locating harm and danger onto discrete bodies and stories. I'm almost there. Um, the sex offender is not only a scapegoat, but also a palliative, a way to literalize simple understandings of sexual harm and freedom um, that do not describe the world we live in, but that ne nevertheless make that world inhabitable for us. Um, the rhetorical strategies of legislatures and then courts um, might be perceived as efforts to manage harm and danger by a steadfast refusal to seriously think about them. Um, rather than consider this distribution of sexually harmful acts across populations, the law has fictively consolidated that harm into a subpopulation. Um, I don't think this is a causal story. I don't think that the judi judicial emancipation or decriminalization of the homosexual caused the court to rule how they did on sex offenders. Nor do I think uh, there's a simple causal story that amplifies social 
anxieties over the past 20 years around sex offenders um, you know, is, is because everyone now likes gay people or something like that. Um, so I don't think this is a causal story, but I don't think it's a coincidence uh, either. I think that the homosexual became a kind of signifier, an ideal type for the consenting adult um, as the renewed metric, as the consenting adult as the figure in adjudicating between sexual harm and sexual freedom, um, and that the freedom accorded to private consensual adult sex acts um, was met with intensified publicity around sex offenses. Um, um, that you know, once we don't know what's going on, uh, what gay people do in their homes, we know what happens outside, and knowing, we have to know everything, and, and know it all online, and knowing feels like, like doing something or preventing something. Um, so it seems that the post-Lawrence homosexual is the figure of the consenting adult, and the consenting adult is, we might all agree, a better metric than gender of object choice in determining sexual harm and freedom, right? I'd rather the state leave me alone when I have sex with my boyfriend and then not leave me alone when I have sex with my boyfriend against his will, right? We all can agree that that's like a better thing. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that consenting adult, the idea has loose ends. It doesn't capture everything as completely or as cleanly as we would like, doesn't really contain sexual violence in all its varieties. Lots of legally consensual sex is still harmful. Lots of legally non-consensual sex might not be so harmful, um, say between old, like teenagers and adults. Um, so too, and, and so too, other concerns, are other moral concerns with sexual violence or um, prostitution or incest might not be collaps collapsible into questions of consent. And yet they are collapsed into questions of consent by Justice Kennedy and Lawrence, where he says, this is not about prostitution, family abuse, whatever, you know, in um, public sex, it's about consensual sex between adults. He sort of makes those other things about consent or not consent when that's not what it's about. Um, or not what it's all only about. Um, I think that consent gets its traction, looks like it's good enough, through and against the social and legal construction of the sex offender, threateningly recidivistic by legal designation, the antithesis of the consenting adult, who violates consent, who violates children, who is the always combustible container of sexual harm and danger, that in some sense allows us to imagine consenting adultness as the only line we need to draw. Um, so I think, again, a little bit kitschy, I think that we want there to be a Yago or a Voldemort, particularly in a, in a judicial era and a national climate marked by new acceptances of sexual life forms and identities in which consent does double duty as our metric of sexual morality and our metric of sexual harm. No doubt there are some very abusive, very harmful people who do very bad things. And I should just say that I hope none of this seems like I'm minimizing sexual violence or the import of sexual violence or of addressing sexual violence. Um, no doubt consent is the necessary starting point, but starting point for legal adjudication in the liberal state. But it is just a starting point, and a more robust and attuned judicial and social vocabulary is required to address an array of sexually unjust and harmful practices that does not collapse into adjudicating with wrong-headed certainty between the normal, everyday, sexually ethical citizen and the unstoppably evil predator, between the transcendent and free homosexual uh, and the dangerous sex offender. Um, so I think where consent may be legally determinative, maybe legally determinative, it masks a pre-Lawrence cultural morality and logic, um, a cultural longing for sexual and social simplicity, for fixed absolutes of right and wrong, for righteousness and vengeance that cannot be disavowed to the juridical freedom promised to the post-Lawrence homosexual. So uh, on that happy note, <laughs> I, I should, well, I, I should, yeah, I mean, I, I'm serious about that. About, I, you know, I, I think when you come to a symposium on sexual violence and then someone tells you why sex offender laws are terrible or something, it's a little bit jarring. Um, uh, my interest is in how this problem is oriented and why, why, we, why we think of the problem this way and, and, and what we might be missing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to talk about the Adam Wal Walsh Act, but I can talk about it later uh, if people want, but I think I'm set for now. Yeah, I'll take questions. Uh, so I know you haven't studied the, the Prop 8 trial recently. I think the defense is recently um, wrapped up, right? I, I think there was some pause, and I think, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so how do, uh, for people who haven't, you know, read Foucault and the theorists and everything, how do you see some of these ideas that you're discussing and kind of um, deconstructing in your work, how do you see them actually play out in this trial that's happening right now? Um, and how would you like to see the discourse changed in that trial? 
Uh, well, there's a couple of ways to answer that. One is it just the invocation of children, I think, is just sort of fascinating from every side. So the argument on the defense is this is bad for children. We're going to have to teach sex to kindergartners because, you know, through marriage education programs, we're going to have to say that gay people can marry, which then somehow gets transmuted into we're going to have to teach kindergartners about sex. Um, on the other side, uh, um, they've, I th you know, the plaintiffs have started using children's testimony as like, I want the state to recognize my two daddies, right, and it's important to me. And so children become the sort of voice of moral authority on both sides of the equation. Um, I don't think that there's anything horribly wrong with that. I think it does collapse like more critical thinking by sort of having a child just stand in for the truth of things. Um, uh, um, what do I think about the Prop 8 case? I think it sucked that it ended up there. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that, in, I mean, sort of in terms of, I don't know how I want to say Foucault or queer theory or whatever, but I think there are a lot of political choices and historical circumstances, political choices that were made in particular moments um, where gay marriage became the sine qua non of gay politics. And I don't think it had to be. Um, and so I think, you know, thinking about like democratizing health care uh, and things like that um, might have been on the agenda and might have eclipsed marriage so that you didn't have to marry to get these thousand and some odd federal benefits. I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question or just kind of ranting. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, I, I think there's, I think the fear here is that, and like in the marriage case in Massachusetts, in Goodridge, they went on pages and pages about how upstanding the, the, the plaintiffs were. Like, Barbara, Bob, Bob goes to the church, and Barbara makes like cakes for her neighbors, and they both have upper middle class jobs, and they have children. And the worry is, right, from the sort of um, Michael Warner, you know, query place, query, uh, is, you know, is that what gays have to look like to get statutory benefits? And what if you don't look like that? Um, um, yeah, I'm not, uh, mm. <laughs> did that get at some of what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about looking at um, To Catch a Predator and SVU and Lolita? Um, can you tell us why you chose those and sort of what you were looking for and what you found? Sure. Um, the Lolita bit is the most underdeveloped. Um, so kind of my hunch, which I think is not sort of obvious in some way, is that I think in large part, our concern over age and age our concern over age and sex is really a proxy for our concern with gender. Um, not always. I mean, that sounds sort of jarring and provocative. And I think, you know, there are good non-gendered reasons why adults shouldn't have sex with ten-year-olds. But I think that, uh, you know, when you look that a lot of the cases, not in the not in the media, but actual cases, right? Usually, with what these cases are are young girls and like stepfathers, right? And so there is a, there is a question of gender and power that get pushed out when you only talk about age and capacity. Um, with To Catch a Predator and SVU, I mean, the sort of quick, annoying answers, I think, I think that not only are these shows pornographic, but they're pornographic in a way that the audience gets to feel like it's doing something just while it watches this sort of pornography take place. And I mean, To Catch a Predator is like almost too easy, so I have to figure out what I'm going to say that like someone doesn't know about it. But it's, it's just, it's just remarkable, right? Like, like, everyone has a name but the girl. She's called a decoy. So, so she's this sort of nameless object. Um, and they have luridly, you know, put the stuff on the, against the black screen about what the guy did. And there's always condoms, right? And condoms are always proof that you, you kind of would rather that there be condoms than not, I guess. But, okay. And, uh, you know, and then it's like the dude. I mean, not, I mean, the dudes are not, like, morally upstanding citizens. But they're always, like, in their 20s. Like, they have no friends. They're in the middle of Ohio. And then... You know, and it plays this sort of sexual script where she's making tea. You've seen the Kathy Griffin thing. She's making tea, and he comes in, and then, you know, right at the point where this scene would climax in a porn, Chris Hansen walks in and, like, morally beheads him, and the cops beat him up. And so, okay, I'm ranting again. But so the, so the question is, you know, um, what's this doing for us? And, 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 and why are we so complicit in thinking that, you know, we're doing something good by watching this show? Um, um, and with SVU, I mean, this, again, I think this is a function of the fact that they need to have ratings, but it's always like the SVU plot is, you know, the girl says she's been abused and you see all these markings and then the guy gets 
punched around by the police, the, the, the suspect, and then it turns out at the end, like, oh, she manipulated the whole thing and it's all for his money, or she really likes getting hit a lot, or something, I mean, whatever. And um, so I think that's interesting. It's sort of the way that the twist of these shows is mis misogyny. Uh, I mean, not always, that's a little bit too reductive of SVU, but, you know, as they, they always do this thing where they sort of go away from the script, but the going away is always kind of pinning it on this, you know, precocious girl or, or whatever. Um, and I think that f what's interesting to me is that both To Catch a Predator and SVU are about law. And, it's, and, and, I, and I think, I haven't figured out why I think that's interesting, but I think it does something to, f to, f to figure law in this picture, you know, as the arm that comes in and makes everything okay, right? Um, and it's where this dissertation goes is that, and this is perhaps evident, right, that law provides this, you know, what I call moral theorizing in the, in the adjudicative mode where everything feels nice, like, now we have a law about it, but that there has to be all sorts of work that's done extra legally, you know, if, if we care about sexual violence. Yeah. Um, super bad is something we haven't talked about, and then it's the uh, one yeah. that's least obvious. <laughs> right. Uh, so when I say that our concern with gender, I think is often a proxy for our concern with uh, age, is a proxy for with gender and sexuality. Um, I think what's interesting is that um, the, the, the idiom of sex between older men and younger women is either it's always already abusive or the girl is precocious. Um, the idiom when it's relations between teenage boys and men is always something pederastic. There's always like something learning that's happening, that's going on. Um, um, and, and Superbad is like all of the other Apatow films, like the, the um, what's his name, McLovin. Right, sort of gets this whole tour of adulthood with the cops, and it's highly homoerotic, right? I mean, they're running around and they're like playing with their guns and whatever, um, um, or maybe homosocial <laughs> would be better. And and so so there, it's interesting because there's sort of this erotically charged thing where teen boys are learning from older men, but then there's also this complete displacement of women. Like women just aren't in these movies really, or they're kind of you know, two-dimensional. And so the whole pederastic relation functions by making women kind of into caricatures, which I think is interesting. Um, I also think that if you took seriously, like um, a whole bunch of second wave feminists and feminist legal theorists talk about how age of consent laws is ne necessary for the protection of girls. And if you take that seriously and think that it really is different, right, that gender does matter, that heterosexuality in one form or another is eroticized dominance of men over women, you know, I love Catherine McKinnon. Uh, I mean, love, hate Catherine McKinnon. Uh, if you take that seriously, then you have to at least give, give some credence to the fact that sex between teenage boys and older men have different, have different coordinates, like have different moral coordinates, um, and, and that, the, that the lack of that heterosexual dynamic and the fact that intergenerational gay sex has for all, happens for all sorts of reasons, like there's no one, like there's no sexual social partners in your high school and you're miserable or whatever, um, I think needs to be talked about. I don't think it can be done in law. I don't think there's going to be like, well, if you're a gay boy, you can have sex with, right. But, uh, but I think that it's, that conversation should happen. I think it's really hard to happen precisely because once you start having that conversation, you sound like an apologist for pedophilia or you, you know, start to like associate gayness with pedophilia, which no one likes to do. <laughs> uh, other questions? Thoughts? I can't believe it's almost one o'clock. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. good, so. cool. Well, thanks for listening, guys. All right, guys, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I apologize again that uh, you all couldn't hear from Lanta today. We all really hope she's okay. Um, I'll keep you guys updated. Um, please join us again tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have um, a talk about women in law firms and women in corporate environments. Same time, same place. And I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you.